One of my favorite parts about these stories that Jesus tells in Luke, parables and stories, is that he leaves us room to interpret them for ourselves. Uh, with Jesus, there's never really a pat answer, a black and white answer. He just kind of tells a story and lets us sit with it for a while and conjugate with it. And, and then we kind of have to understand through our own experiences, through our own identity, through our own reason, our own intellect, we have to make sense of what Jesus has given us and the truth that Jesus gives us. And so it is with this story today. Um, the lawyer's response is not recorded, according to Frederick Buechner. Uh, you know, Jesus says, go and do likewise. Go show mercy to your neighbor. And the lawyer doesn't say anything back. But you have to think the lawyer had to have said something, right? And not because he's a lawyer, nothing against lawyers at all, but because this is what they did back then. They talked about these things and they argued about them. They argued about what the law meant. What were the two greatest commandments? Love your neighbor and love, love your God and love your neighbor. Uh, you know, what about all the other commandments? Which are the greatest among those? So they would have these debates, teachers of the law, scribes, elders, chief priests, and they'd sit around and talk about this stuff. And Jesus was having one of these discussions when the topic came up, who is your neighbor? And without answering it directly, Jesus asks us, who is your neighbor? Essentially, this is uh, what's called in Jewish terms a midrash, which is kind of an explanation of the text, where you go a little deeper in the text and you try to understand why the text is written as it is, why the law says what it does. And a couple weeks ago, I talked about neighborly love. I think it's something that a lot of us are dependent upon, even though we don't acknowledge it. Uh, neighborly love is an important part of not only our religion, but I think of all religions. So again, who is our neighbor? Who is our neighbor? Uh, some people would say, your neighbor is the other. Your neighbor is the other. Someone who is not you. Now, for there to be an other, there has to be a you. You have to identify yourself as yourself. So you might look at it and say, I stand here as uh, I'm white, I'm a male, uh, you might say I'm a Redskins fan, you might say, um, what, I, you know, I, I drive a green car, um, I'm an American, I'm from the Northeast, and on and on and on. You identify yourself as such. And whenever you do that, unknowingly and unconsciously, you create another. You create an other. So if I'm white, Someone who is not like me is something other than me. They might be Hispanic, they might be Asian, they might be black, whatever it is. But you see, I've identified myself as white, and therefore not being white creates a distance and a separation. Right? And that's just kind of how it is, and that's how we've grown as humans over the year. We identify ourselves into groups, into clans, into nations, and we say, this is me, and anything that's not me is something other. And when we create that other, again, unconsciously, we create that separation. And that separation makes it awfully easy to silence the other, because they're not us. They are something else. We silence the other. And we can oftentimes then diminish the other and it kind of leads down a slippery slope to dehumanizing the other, which makes it awfully easy to slaughter six million Jews in Europe, to uh, kill hundreds of thousands of Tutsis in Rwanda. Um, that's, the, that's the germ, and that's the, the kernel of genocide, is creating this other from just saying, this is who I am. So I often think about this passage of the Good Samaritan, because the first two people that walked by this injured man who was robbed had an affinity with this person. I mean, they were of the same clan. They were of the same race. Why didn't they help him? Why did it take someone who was other to help this guy? I think that's probably behind Jesus' story, is the question, why did two people who were just like this guy pass by? Was there something about him? Was he a Redskins fan and they were Ravens fans? Is that how it went? I mean, there had to have been something there, but they passed by. So oftentimes, otherness can tell us who our neighbor is and who we should be serving. Another 
uh, explanation that I've heard is that your neighbor is someone who's needy. Anyone who has needs is your neighbor. So Jesus is saying to us, your neighbor is someone who has needs and you need to meet those needs. You need to go and show that neighbor mercy. Okay, so this man clearly had needs which were not met by the first two. So clearly they were not neighborly with him. And how many of us meet every need that comes through our door? I mean, a lot of us have charity fatigue already, but I know for me, what happens to me is I drive up to Baltimore for a diocesan business, for the Diocese of, uh, of Maryland, and it's in North Baltimore, and to get back, I have to drive back through Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard, at which it seems like every stoplight, there's someone asking for change. There's someone who's unemployed, there's someone who's living on the street who just needs a couple bucks, and so they go from car to car when the stoplights backs you up. And so when I drive to the diocese, I'm usually wearing my collar. It's not good for me to just kind of roll my window up and look the other way. So I, I made a pact with myself, and I kind of said, all right, whatever loose change I have in the car, quarters, dimes, nickels, whatever dollar bills I have in my wallet, I'm going to give. And I'm just not even going to think about it. I'm just going to do it. Except for 20 all right? So I go up to $20, and that's my limit. Um, and, and do I do this, you know, all the time? I have to say no. There are times when it might be a little dark, it might be early evening, and the sun's going down, and it's dark, and I say, do I really want to roll my window down? Do I want to make myself vulnerable? Would I rather kind of go into self-protection mode and self-defense and not meet the other, not meet the needy. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't, you know? And I think we can probably all say the same thing. But, you know, I think, um, what's the word? Making something easy. Convenience. Convenience plays a part in this too. That if I'm late, I'm less likely to stop. And they actually did a study um, in, in the book, The Tipping Point by Malcolm Gladwell. He writes about a study that was done to show how much convenience plays in meeting people's needs. So what they did is they took a group of people who were very benevolent, very loving, almost saps, pushovers. They took a group of seminarians, and they said, you have, you have a test to take in this room on the campus. And then you've got to finish that test and go all the way across campus and hand it in on the other side of campus. And you have to do it in 15 minutes or else you're going to fail. That was the task. And in between, on the road, from this room to the journey's end, they put someone who was in need, whether it was someone who had fallen down and sprained their ankle, someone who needed money, or whatever it was, somebody needed a ride, whatever it was. They put someone there in the middle to test the seminarians, to see what they would do. These are God-fearing people, right? These are people who are trained to be you know, servants. Clearly, they're going to stop, right? Of course, they're going to see that you know, convenience is outweighed by meeting somebody's need. Of course, they're going to stop. How many of them stopped out of 10? Two. Two stopped. Eight of them just flew on by and said, I'll get you later. You know? I'll, I'll get you on the way back. Don't worry. I, I, let me call someone for you. And they go and they hand their paper in. And I think all too often the same is with us. So, You've been thinking, you know, who is my neighbor? For me, I can answer for myself. My neighbor, I've decided, is whoever I don't want to see. Whoever I don't want to see. Because sometimes it's the other. Sometimes it's someone with whom I think I have nothing in common. You know, you're older than me. You're richer than me. You didn't go to the same school as I did. 